Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. It's your host, Danny Haifong, and we have a packed program today. The first half, we have a special guest, Professor Richard Wolf, to go into all that is happening in the world economy in the multipolar world with a geopolitical flair. Uh, I'll just introduce Richard Wolf as he comes in. Professor Wolf is a professor emeritus of economics at University of Massachusetts Amherst. He's the visiting professor at the New School in New York, and he's the co-founder of Democracy at Work and its weekly radio and TV show, Economic Update, which I recommend you all follow. And you can see his websites, both of them, his own personal and Democracy at Work in the video description. Professor Wolf, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Danny. I'm very glad to be here. Yes, well, we have we have quite a bit to cover. First, let's talk about uh, Russia and Ukraine because the economic situation worldwide, of course, has been greatly impacted by this conflict. Now, uh, Russia in particular has said and has stated uh, through its president, Vladimir Putin, that it is now the largest economy in Europe in purchasing power parity terms. And not only this, and I would like you, if you could do, describe what that is, purchasing power parity, and why it's so significant uh, Russia is now at this stage, but also even Business insiders reporting now that wages are up somewhere between 6 to 20% in Russia over the course of this conflict in 2023. And uh, this is particularly true in the private sector. So, Professor Wolf, given all that the United States and the West, in particular NATO, has thrown at Russia in the realm of economic warfare, how has this happened? And could you describe the significance of purchasing power parity as well in, in your analysis? I'll kick it to you. Sure. Um, for many years, for, for decades, maybe even for a century or two, Economists have been tasked by the media, by the public, with explaining the different standards of living, for lack of a better term, from one country to another. How do you compare, you know, Yemen with Nigeria or Canada with uh, Malaysia and so forth? On one hand, you can simply translate the amount of money on average earned in the Malaysian currency and use the exchange rates in the world between the Malaysian currency and Canadian currency and say, well, this is how much the economy is worth. Excuse me. But the problem with that is it doesn't take into account that the whole structure of prices may be very different in those two countries. So that you know, a dollar worth of Malaysian currency may go way further in a whole range of commodities than a dollar worth of Canadian currency might go in Canada. So a variety of mechanisms were developed over the years to adjust the comparisons. One of them was called purchasing power parity. In other words, you adjust the two economies' numerical values by a number which you have reason to believe captures the different purchasing power of the two currencies, each in their own specific national environment. Uh, and then there are long debates about which kind of measure is more appropriate for one or the other. Uh, unless you're an economics student, and for most of them, this is an unspeakably boring exercise, you don't get involved in the details uh, because the larger picture doesn't usually change all that much. But when the larger picture doesn't change, and by the way, the larger picture is that Russia is an enormous economy in Europe, but not as big and rich as Britain or France or Germany uh, or Italy, uh, the big or Spain or the big economies of Europe. On the other hand, if you adjust for what you can actually buy for a Russian ruble 
in Kiev, uh, well, that was a mistake, not in the Ukraine, but in, in uh, Petrograd or in Moscow, well, then you get a different number and Vladimir Putin can boastfully say, uh, look, uh, we're doing well. Here's the important reality that Mr. Putin has every right to point to. And there's no nice way of saying this. And you try to run an honest program. So I'm going to not be nice. I'm going to be honest. One of the great strategic mistakes made in world history, I think it's as big as that. And I'm not given to dramatic statements. But one of the great mistakes, at least in my lifetime, was the mistake of the collective West, by which I mean basically the G7, the United States and its Western European allies, plus Canada and Japan, was the notion that a war in Ukraine pitting the West against Russia militarily excluding the West, except for the weapons and the financial support to Ukraine, that that would be sufficient to win this war and to win this war quickly. And the basic idea was that the collective West was so strong, so powerful in the world economy that if they decided in a coordinated way to target one country for sanctions, in this case, Russia, that that country could not survive that experience, that the ruble would collapse. That's a quote. That's a quote from some of the highest officials in the West, that Russia would be, quote, brought to its knees also a quotation from a variety of speakers in the West, that Russia would have to sue for peace or risk disintegrating. Everybody knows that Russia is the largest country by geography in the world, so it encompasses an immense uh, land service, that it would fall apart, that it would break into constituent parts, Uh, to be carved up uh, for competing spheres of influence between Japan, China, and the West uh, in any way that a fantasy could sketch. Enormous commitments were made on the basis of these shared calculations. And there is no way to say this that is going to not sound like an exaggeration, but it isn't. Everything about that prediction was false. Everything about that prediction has proved wrong. The ruble did not collapse. Russia did not collapse. In fact, what you had in Russia, I'm going to play a little bit with you here, but it's in order to make the people understand the magnitude. When World War II broke out, The United States was coming off the worst collapse of capitalism in modern history. The the 1929 crash and the Great Depression, so-called, of the 1930s. After a decade of disastrous economic decline, the United States entered World War II a very difficult war fought over immense distances at spectacular, for that time, costs. It was an open question how and whether the United States could pull this off. Well, what emerged was the discovery in the United States that war can be better business for capitalism than peace ever could. And that you could reorganize a crisis-ridden private capitalism. Alternatively, 
as a government-driven defense capitalism or war capitalism or militaristic capitalism. The chief intellectual guide for all of this was the work of the British economist um, Keynes, and it was called Keynesianism. But what the United States discovered in World War II was that mobilizing for the war, then fighting the war, then maintaining the military dominance that the war bequeathed to the United States because of the collapse of Britain and France and Germany and Japan and Russia, that those could be bases for a successful capitalism based on, and this is the phrase used in economics, military Keynesianism. Government spending, government deficit spending, vastly focused on the military. Why am I telling you this? Because that's what Vladimir Putin is sitting on. A recognition that he or Russia can do the same thing in their country that Franklin Roosevelt accomplished or is credited with accomplishing in the United States. And that Russia, far from being destroyed, emerges, now that we are two years into this war, emerges stronger, bigger, more successful. And the double irony is not only were the predictions of the West completely wrong, but they forgot their own history. The origins of New Dealism, or what in Europe is called social democracy, comes out of this period of the collapse of private capitalism into depression and the need for the government to come in to save capitalism from itself. All that Putin has done, and I don't mean to diminish his achievement in any way. This is a leader who is now sitting in a country where he is immensely popular, where his popularity makes people like Biden or Macron or Sunak jealous with envy because they're not in the same league you know, they're worried about single-digit popularity. That's not Mr. Putin's concern. Not Mr. Putin, not Xi Jinping. Not, they're doing fine when it comes to polling. Not an issue. Wow. Wow. By the way, the same polling companies are doing the polling. So you don't really even have that uh, caveat to throw at this situation. So here's the bottom line. Russia did two things. It discovered military Keynesianism, which they were on their way to discovering anyway. What this war did is force them to do it in a hothouse fashion. They had to suddenly pour massive amounts of resources to do this. And again, it's not so different from what happens, you know, once it becomes clear in the United States that's already true by 1939-40, that you're going to have to go in. And now the effort is made. Uh, that effort is very popular. World War II remains the most popular war of the United States in the 20th century. It had solidarity. It had the coming together of the left and the right. The only bad guys were fascists in Germany and Japan, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You had a set of circumstances uh, that you're not going to get so quickly again. But Mr. Putin gets credit for, for figuring that all out and making all that happen. But he gets credit on another score where he has to share the credit. And that is that the world economy had changed. And that's not so much because of Russia, but is a great deal because of China. 
uh, and, but this fortuitousness, the fact that Russia could develop a domestic military Keynesianism coupled to an exploding global footprint for the People's Republic of China allied with such a Russia, once you put these two things together, then the mistaken calculation of the West takes on the, the dimensions that I began with, a really historic screw up. And if I could, I would suggest I would suggest that people think in these large terms for a while because you need to break out of the last two centuries to be very schematic. The first century is the British Empire, 19th and 20th century, fading out. And the 20th and 21st, the United States replacing the British. And so the whole world is full of the English language and the whole world is centered on Washington and London in varying ways. Where the center of all global finance is Washington and London. Where the center of all cutting edge technology, or if not all of it, most of it is in Washington and London. All of that is over. Those empires are done. That position is over. And you are going to make catastrophic mistakes and miscalculations if you don't break that mindset. And what you're watching in Washington, and this is true whether you are Mr. Trump or you are Mr. Biden, you are watching people so deeply entrapped by that mindset that they can't see clearly. And whereas before, when I made that argument, I would have to give lots of evidence. I don't have to give uh, evidence. Everybody is very worried that I just might be right because they're seeing it literally every day. And the war in Ukraine is just, it's just not going well. That war is lost. That war is finished. That's over. The, only, the details remain. The horror for the people of Ukraine, that will be the lasting image in people's minds. And a boastful Russia and a very badly burned Europe, those are the results of all of this. And they are going to have to be paid for. Someone is going to take a fall for what has happened to Ukraine. And someone, no individual, but a group, are going to take the fall for what even in Europe is called the deindustrialization of Europe. I mean, stop, folks. We're in the midst of, the, of, a, of a world, a planet, in which Asia, Africa, and Latin America are focused, number one, on the industrialization of their economies. That's their goal, that's their objective, that's their priority, that's their, and they're looking at the place where they got these ideas from, busily de-industrializing, not because it's a strategy of advance, but because it's a hopeless accommodation to a reality they are not yet willing to challenge. And there will be Europeans, there already are, who are determined to challenge it. And when they do, Olaf Scholz, Emmanuel Macron, Sudak, these are going to be vague, distant, irrelevant memories that they would rather you don't bring up. Yes. Uh, I mean, at this point, too, the distinction between what's going on with Russia and we could say the BRICS economies and in Europe is just couldn't be any more stark. Uh, months ago, uh, the Eurozone, there were polls after poll, uh, there, polls after polls. 
analyses all throughout the Financial Times and other outlets claiming that the Eurozone was already in a recession. And uh, the economic numbers are not looking much better months later into 2024. Uh, as you said, there's protests now, I believe, Germany, France, every, you know, and, and across Europe over the last several months as well, uh, protesting the economic pain that people are uh, experiencing in this part of the world. That's that's a quite that's quite different from, yeah, what is happening in Russia and the rest of the multipolar world. Let me give you a couple of examples that will drive home where this is going. Under German law, and remember, Germany is still the powerhouse economy of Europe. I mean, it's still the engine. Uh, it's a remarkable story for another time. Under German law, if a German corporation, capitalist corporation, can show that governmental policy damages the company, loses it significant amounts of money, under the law, such companies can petition the parliament and the government for redress in cash. Okay, countries, uh, companies, I'll pick one that everybody knows, Siemens, one of the most important conglomerates uh, in electric machinery and a whole host of other products around the world. Couldn't be a better known name, uh, Siemens. Here, I'll give you another name that has done it also, Volkswagen. They have already filed the documents demanding billions, with a B, billions and billions of dollars, or in this case, euros, from the German government to offset their losses from the deindustrialization that they have suffered directly and indirectly from German policy. Okay, what are you seeing? Well, you're seeing the business community saying to the politicians, because that's what this is, you run the government, okay, we have given you enormous authority, okay, enormous power in the post-war period, okay, you have decided to align our societies with the United States, okay, and you are doing that in the face of the fact that the United States is escaping without rising energy prices impacting them the way we've been impacted. The sanctions didn't cost the U.S. anything or relatively little compared to what it cost us. Okay, that's your policy, but we have the right to demand of you a compensation. Well, you know, the unions aren't stupid in Europe. The unions are gearing up and they have become public. They want compensation for the workers also from deindustrialization. If unemployment is rising, if real wages are not rising, if they're supposed to be cutbacks in government services because of the falling of government revenue due to deindustrialization, they want the mass of the working class to be taken care of. Uh-oh, here's the problem. In no country, including Germany, can the government support both of these demands at the same time. Given the recession, given the commitment of the United States, at least, to a war continuing in Ukraine for, quote, unquote, as long as it takes, that's President Biden, well, then the Europeans have nothing to look forward to, even in the way of anything other than a growing cascade 
of such appeals for money, which will have more and more political clout the more the bigger companies line up to do it. And if Siemens and Volkswagen are already doing it, no German company is going to hesitate once that's underway. So you're, you're setting in motion now levels of pressure in a European situation, which is why I become relatively more confident of making predictions, which I don't do. And I'm not making one now. But were I to make one, Europe is a place that is is exp experiencing explosive contradictions. That's really what this is. And unless something happens real quickly, drastically, to alter the situation, um, that's where you're going to see extraordinary, rapid political and economic and social change coming. Um, and what you're seeing now, the leadership, the pale uh, cheerleading squad for the United States, that's going I mean, that's going to be blown away with a sense of embarrassment that they ever had, you know, the von der Leyen or the that Danish clown. I mean, this is this is silly. I mean, just plain silly. You're already picking it up below the surface, as I say, in 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 business, bitter business uh, periodicals, where there are really high level business advisors articulating what used to be only spoken in the beer hall late at night can now be talked on. On television, prime time, it's coming. Yeah, yes, indeed. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Uh, this is Professor Richard Wolf joining me. Please hit the like button so more people can hear his economic wisdom. Now, uh, Professor Wolf, I wanted to now move to China. So the news is, is that China has released its economic growth numbers for 2023 at 5.2%. Now, the Paul Krugmans of the world, the Western mainstream media doing what, uh, or at least playing at uh, what seems to be economic analysis, has claimed that China's economy is on the verge of collapse, that there are indicator after indicator, mainly in the property sector, real estate sector, that show that China is on the decline while the United States has released its numbers uh, well after China's uh, at 3.1% growth. And the enthusiasm for this has been just wall to wall in the pages of the New York Times, Washington Post, etc. Now, China and the United States are uh, at significant odds. The U.S. has been employing many measures to try to decouple and contain China's rising economy. Could you talk about this decoupling myth and the reality of the situation? Is the West, uh, in particular the United States, correct it, through its periodicals and mainstream media that China's on the collapse? And if not, well, what exactly is going on and how does it relate to this emerging multipolar world, the rise of BRICS, etc.? Okay, there's a lot of noise around all of this, as you rightly point out. And so it requires a little bit of um, <laughs> opening the space so that we can talk without being lopsided cheerleaders for one or the other. So let me begin with China. China is an enormous economic experiment. It should be understood in that light. It should not be held up to standards that don't apply to an enormous historical experiment. Let me explain. A half a century ago, China was, by all counts, among the poorest most backward countries on this planet and had been in that position 
a position that Xi Jinping refers to often as a period of humiliation for two or three centuries, during which large and small colonial powers could simply arrive at a port city along the Pacific coast of China, uh, send in a few cannons, a few troops, and establish an enclave, a portion of a, of a city which would be for them and their nationals to set up shop and to exploit whatever opportunities for trade uh, might exist. Um, over the last half century, this country, now numbering roughly 1.4 billion people, you know, that is over four times the population of the United States, much larger than Europe, and so on and on. Over this relatively short historic time, half a century, more or less, they went from the worst poverty imaginable. For those of you who have never read a Western work on China at that time, the work of a missionary family, um, the author Pearl Buck, B-U-C-K, uh, The Good Earth, I believe, is the title of her novel. She wrote more than one. would we'll give you an insight. Uh, you won't forget it. The images are incredible in that book. So here you are half a century later, and it is the admir admirable object of almost disbelief, or in the case of Paul Krugman, straight out disbelief. Nobody has believed it. They didn't believe it in the 1950s and 60s when there was talk of communes and of incredible rates of growth. They didn't believe it later on when the government shifted, they didn't quite believe it when Russia and China came to loggerheads that included military conflict between them. They didn't believe it more recently when economic growth rates were listed every year between six and nine percent and sometimes even more. When the usual relationship between GDP growth in China and that in the United States was a relationship of three to one, three times faster in China than in the United States. More recently, when they said they had lifted somewhere between six and eight hundred million people out of global poverty into middle income level, people didn't believe that either. People didn't believe any of it. The most typical reaction of intellectuals from the West going to China and coming back was a statement that began, you can't really believe it, but, and then they would describe modern cities that they had visited, modern institutions, and because we're going to end up there, the peculiar quality of China that instead of allowing slums to develop, they build the housing ahead of the people's ability to afford to buy it, meaning that there are blocks of empty, completed or nearly completed apartments. As if this were some sign of massive uh, resource investment that had gone astray rather than a strategy, which, by the way, may be the wrong strategy, but it's a strategy coming out of a country which, strategically speaking, is not the first one you would want to throw stones of criticism at. But it is a huge country. It has serious raw material and food 
issues. It has a history of an expatriate community elsewhere around the world of Chinese citizens with complicated relationships back home. It is trying things of all kinds, some of which don't work, because that's what experiments are all about. So yeah, they have problems, they have imbalances. Their record in the field of civil liberties is not what you want. There's all kinds of social criticisms that can be made, and by the way, are made in and by Chinese people about what's going on there. So this is in no way what I'm about to say, no way some kind of celebration of China as if they don't have serious political, economic, and cultural problems. They do. But they're quite different from those in the United States. And the way to begin to understand the difference is to go back to look at it, the big picture. The United States is an empire going down. China is an empire going up. And the ride up is way better than the ride down as Americans are discovering and as the British have an entire century of having had to live through. And if you study Britain at all, you will know just how painful it all has been economically, politically, culturally, financially, you name it. So let's look at the comparison. So we start with where you began. And that's perfectly legitimate. The United States is ecstatic that the 3.2% growth rate of the last quarter compares to the 5.2% growth rate in China. Now, on the one hand, that's reasonable because the gap between China and the United States is now smaller than it's been for most of the last 20, 30 years where it was, to remind you, three to one, 6%, 2%, 8%, 2.5% to 3%, and so on. So yeah, there's less of a gap. The Chinese economy is still growing. It's still growing faster than the United States, and it's a bigger country to begin with. So you're talking about vast creation of wealth. Let me give you an idea of that, just again, statistically, so it's in everyone's head. You can add up the GDP, gross domestic product. That's simply a crude, very crude, rough measure of the total output of goods and services in a country in a calendar year. So it gives you a rough idea how big the country is, relative to some other country. And at the beginning of this program, we talked about purchasing power parity and other measurement details. But let's be real clear. The GDP of China, together with its allies, and I'm here going to count only the original BRICS allies, Russia, China, India, South Africa, and Brazil. Those countries. There are now six more that more recently, a few months ago, joined the BRICS. I could add those. It'll just make what I'm about to tell you even more extreme. In the year 2020, they passed like ships in the night. What am I referring to? Well, the United States and its allies the G7, United States, Britain, France, Germany, Italy, Canada, and Japan. The year 2020, the total GDP in the world of the G7 and of the BRICS 
was about the same. About $30 trillion. Here we are roughly three years later. The share of total output of the G7 has dropped from 30 to 29%. And of the BRICS, before I add the latest six countries, 33%. It's over. It's finished. The lines are unmistakable. And 5.2 relative to 3.2 only makes the gap bigger. Why is this important? Again, the reasons are many. I'm going to give you a few in the hopes they stay in your mind. Every country in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And let me lean across my screen here and say to you, every country without exception is having private, intense conversations in the presidential palace, in the halls of the Congress or the parliament of, of each country. If we need in this country a huge loan to build up our cities, to finally have a proper education system, to finally construct a national health insurance system, to build a railroad, to bring in high technology, to da, 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 whatever. It used to be that the place we go to get an investment, to borrow money, to secure a market, to do whatever we have to do, to move forward in becoming less of a poor country, in becoming more industrialized, we would have to go to London or New York or Paris or Berlin or you get the picture. They don't have to do that anymore. They have an option. They can go to London, Paris and Washington. They probably will. They probably do. But you can be damn sure that they have also organized a trip to Beijing or to New Delhi or to Sao Paulo. They're going to play one against the other. They're going to see where they get the bigger deal, the better deal. And they're prepared to give as good as they get. They will make deals and provide China or Russia or India what they need in exchange for the help. And they're going to discover, as they already have, that the wealth of the BRICS being now larger than that of the G7, you're going to get sooner or later a better deal. And you may not be ideologically you know, aligned with the BRICS. Often they aren't. But they know where the bread is to be buttered. They weren't so thrilled about being aligned with Washington or London either. But they knew where the bread was buttered. And when people reproached them, they said, well, you know, where are we going to go to get the help? Everything has changed. Nothing is what it was. And staying in the old mindset is leading to terrible miscalculation, as we discussed in Ukraine. But in case any of you are wondering, the exact parallel miscalculation lies at the base of what is going on in Gaza or in Yemen or in Syria or in Iraq and Iran. Yeah, the United States can bomb or throw a missile. It cannot undo what I have been describing. 
That's why the votes are lopsided in the United Nations around Ukraine. That's why they're lopsided around Israel and uh, the Palestinians. It's just, it's not what it was. You cannot function the way you did. Britain by now is a minor, irrelevant adjunct to what the United States is doing. You could see it. The United States decides to bomb Yemen. England says, gee, can we send along an airplane and drop something too? Sure. Why not? What difference does it make? Answer, none at all. The irrelevance of the English stands as a stark, I was about to say monument. Monuments come after. What Britain is, is something that comes before. Britain is telling the French, the Germans, the Italians, the Spanish, you're going to become Greater Britain. You're going to become adjuncts to the United States because your only alternative will be to join the BRICS. And that's too big a shock to your system so far for you to even contemplate it. I should qualify this for those of you who keep track. Mr. Macron did inquire about joining the BRICS, but they turned him down. in the hopes that there's not a break in the communication, let me add a couple more realities about the changing world economy. And that will capture some of the ironies of all of this. China, this last year, achieved, among many other goals, the position of the largest exporter of automobiles in the world. Why? Well, the answer is Russia and Ukraine and sanctions. Give you an idea of how this works. Russia hit back against Europe when they were sanctioned, oil and gas couldn't be sold uh, in Europe. The pipeline was blown up and all of that. And what the, Ru the Russians did was stop selling automobiles. And even more important, stop buying automobiles from the Europeans, which is where Russians more and more were buying their cars. Well, what did the Russians do? They cut a deal with China. We'll sell you oil and gas, which you badly need, and we will switch our people from European automobile purchase to Chinese automobile purchase. The Russian economy is big enough that these suddenly massive new purchases of automobiles from China shipped to Russia took China over its number two and number three position in world export 
of automobiles. China had been number three after Germany and Japan. Then it had been number two after Japan. But this last year, China became number one. And let me remind everyone, nothing exemplifies the dominant thing of modern economic development than the automobile. It is the core structure of the modern economy based on trucks and automobiles and vehicles and taxis and all the rest, auto, uh, buses and you name it. So if you're dominant in that industry, it speaks volumes. If you're the largest, it means you get to exploit what are called economies of scale. The fact that the larger the number of automobiles you produce, the more you can fine tune the manufacturer to lower the cost of each part below what it might have been if you only ordered 10 million rather than 20 million of something. The same applies when you buy inputs in huge quantities. Whatever the gains already known, gains from size of market, economies of scale, there will be more of them and the country that will be in the best position to realize them will not be Germany and it will not be Japan, who were two countries in the G7, but it will be China, which is a country in the BRICS. China's already the dominant player in the electric vehicle business. That will become more so for the same reasons. The, the irony, the miscalculation in Ukraine included not seeing the secondary effects in the auto industry and how that would rebound to Russia's advantage because they're going to get cheaper cars from China than they had to pay in Europe, as well as cementing an alliance, and as well as guaranteeing a market for their oil and their gas. You're just seeing a restructuring. Here's another example, either yesterday or today. Information was released. I'm going to make a complicated topic simple. And the information shows that once President Trump, back in 2017 and 18, decided he would reorient American foreign economic policy away from neoliberalism, away from globalization, and towards what ought to be called economic nationalism, because that's what it is. When he decided to do that, and he hit China with tariff war, you may remember, a trade war, you may remember, it meant that uh, goods coming from China uh, being offloaded in San Francisco or San Diego or wherever uh, they were coming in would have to pay a hefty tariff. Now, Mr. Trump, who's not a sharpest knife in the drawer, uh, kept telling us how the Chinese were paying for this tariff. They weren't. A tariff is paid for by the importer, which would be a United States company. If you bring in Chinese motors, you pay China the price of the motor that China demands. If there's a tariff, it's paid to Washington by the importing country. Uh, company, not by anybody else. Okay, so the, the study is now in. We've had nearly two administrations, 
Mr. Trump and the first, if if there's a second, of Mr. Biden. And what do we see? <laughs> we see that the supply chains, which had gone from the United States to China, because China was providing more and more of what goes into whatever manufacturing is still done in the United States, that the Chinese cleverly did what every other country subjected to this kind of treatment has done in the past two to three centuries. The Chinese export what they need to export, whether it's a finished product or an intermediate good, to a third country that's not on the bad list in Washington. I'll pick one, Ghana, or I'll pick another one, Paraguay, or I'll pick another one, Malaysia. And then they transship, they ship it to that country, offload it in the dock from one ship. That ship leaves, another ship comes in, they load the same material back on that ship flying the flag of Malaysia, no tariff, or the flag of Ghana, no tariff, or the flag of pick whatever one you want, and the goods come to the United States, which means more interruption for the supply chain, more costs pushing up the inflation rate for the supply chain, but very little damage to China because China continues to produce what it did before, only now before shipping it to the US, they ship it to Malaysia and then transship it from Malaysia to the United States. Oldest gambit in the book. And now we know it's being used to get around or I mean, it is so sad. You know, if you're the third, fourth or fifth modern empire to go down, your ability to manage it should have gotten better. It hasn't. It remains the trauma that can't be overcome, that can't be faced. So you have this absurd situation that we celebrate 3.2% and pretend that China, with its 5.2%, is not A, growing much faster, and B, that 5.2% is very low for China in terms of its recent history. And therefore, the likely outcome is over the next year and a half, it'll go back up. May not, but it, may, it very well may, because that's the trajectory that they've been able to sustain for all the years that the same skeptics were full of the same articles that I read in the same New York Times about, and by the way, I admit it, I wondered, maybe the Chinese are cooking the books. They're not the first country to do it, not by a long shot. Uh, and we are not in a position in this country to throw stones. But it was possible. But by now, watching what the long term is, the Chinese were smart. You need, if you're going to become the new empire, you need people to have confidence in your numbers. So in the end, you have your own reasons why you better say pretty much what you have to say. Otherwise, you fool your own people, and that's a problem. And you make the rest of the world not believe you, which is another kind of problem. And the Chinese don't have that. I mean, the Chinese don't seem to be uh, deluded uh, about that at all. Yes, no, no, they don't. And, uh, you know, in terms of a few things, I mean, I know uh, we are running out of time, so I definitely want to uh, let you go. But uh, yeah, you know, in terms of, whether we use the term empire, I mean, I wouldn't use the term empire to describe China in the modern sense. But uh, I think what you describe in terms of China's ability, you describe what China has been able to invest in, 
these new latest numbers show that China is growing just in, in ways that are hard to imagine in this economic environment worldwide in these areas of high tech and clean energy. Uh, and to be able to do this, to raise standard of living in China, and also to become part of this new world ecosystem of multipolarity and BRICS, et cetera, definitely puts China as a global leader, a global power uh, that uh, the United States in the West overall, but especially the United States, which seems to be dragging the West along, don't, doesn't have really any answers for other than the same tired ones that we see a lot of uh, in a lot of cases with regard to Russia. So, uh, Professor Wolf, your analysis here has been invaluable. Um, I know you have to go. So uh, do you have any other closing remarks and, uh, you know, anywhere where people can find you? Sure. Let me offer both of them. Uh, and let, let me end with a comment about China. You know, I'm an observer. I have no special um, access or, or knowledge other than what I try to accumulate over time. But I would say we are in uncharted waters. We have not had, we, and by the we, I mean we in the West. I am part of the West. Uh, my mother was German, my father French, and I'm an American. So that's as West as you can get, I assume. Um, and we we know about the Roman Empire, we know about the Greek Empire and the Turkish Empire, but those are kind of Western empires that we know about the British Empire and we know about the American Empire. We, we know that there were sort of empires in Asia and so forth, and maybe even in Africa and, and so forth, but we don't know much about them. In the modern era, Europe has been dominant, and countries of European descent, let's call it, have been dominant. And where they aren't the only group, they have decimated or ethnically cleansed whoever else was around. The Chinese, therefore, are new. China is a genuine non-Western phenomenon to be the most powerful, the most rapidly growing. The whole world is going to have to get used to it. And the whole world is going to know about it because modern telecommunications will let everybody know. And what that means is that the Chinese have a kind of opportunity that is remarkable. They may become the next empire. When I use images like one going down and one coming up, the Chinese may come up and become an empire different because it's in the East and yet not so different because it's following the model of a singular power as empire. But China seems unusually able and willing to work collectively with other nations, to formulate the BRICS, to have enormous equals, Russia, a bigger country by geography, India, now a bigger country by population, not by much, but an equivalent. This is setting yourself up to be part of a group in which others are powerful, very powerful. And there may be a model here of collectivity on our little planet that we have never imagined before. And that will be brought to us all by the Chinese, because nobody else understood that possibility or saw that opportunity or saw the need to grab at it because the alternative is too much like uh, the war of all against 
all, which has been so bad a feature of the Western experience with empire. But I do think we need to understand that ours is in decline and that the fundamental issue for a declining economy always was, do you do that with style? Do you do that with the recognition that this is happening to you and coming to terms with the others, including those that are on the heady rise up? Or do you attempt to smash them down and prevent them? The little corner of the British Empire that we now call the United States was once an annoying, poor corner of the British Empire. It decided to strike out on its own. The British left, sent over some troops, and tried to crush the operation. The British were defeated. In 1812, the British tried again, and they were defeated. They didn't try again. They wrestled in the Civil War with whether it might be clever to ally with the South rather than the North. Remember, they were the ones who bought the cotton that the slaves cultivated. But they didn't. They went with the North. And never again did they try to stop the new emerging colossus, the new emerging empire. The United States seems right now to be where the British were at the time of the American Revolution, trying to put the lid on Chinese development with the trade war and the tariff war and going after the Huawei corporation and not letting them sell chip making machinery and all of the other things, none of which succeed. And they still haven't learned the lesson. Maybe you'd be better off coming to terms with the Chinese. They have to have their chance just like you did but that can be worked out so that we don't destroy each other in the vain effort to undo the history that is now unfolding all around us. The best place to follow our work is the website you see on your screen in front of you, democracyatwork.info, uh, or you can go to my own, RD Wolf with two Fs, rdwolf.com. Everything we do is there, uh, no charge for any of it, um, and you'd be welcome to make whatever use of it you can. Our hope is simply by developing these kinds of analyses to counteract the, the boring chorus of the mainstream media, which you, Danny, do in your way, and we're basically doing the same kind of thing uh, in our way. Well, Professor Wolf, it was great to be with you today. Thank you so much for your contributions here. And yes, uh, those websites are in the video description. And we'll have to be in touch. Take care, be well, and have a great weekend. You too. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. All right, everybody, that was Professor Richard Wolf. Uh, always a pleasure to have him. I'm going to react to the Israel ICJ situation very soon. Uh, I did have an internet connection problem. That's been happening a little bit more on StreamYard. I'm going to have to definitely get in touch with my internet company about that because that was very, thank goodness, Richard's, uh, Professor Wolf's uh, internet stayed because he was able to keep going while I figured out the issue. It came back. But I'm definitely going to have to figure that out. It's happened a few times on stream now. It's becoming more frequent. I'm not sure what's going on. In any event, I do want to close this program. Stay here because we are going to react to the big news today, which was the International Criminal or International Criminal Court. No, the International Court of Justice 
ruling on the or giving a preliminary interim verdict on the situation with regard to Gaza, the verdict being uh, that uh, whether provisional measures are going to be taken or we're going to be taken against Israel um, in order to uh, continue on with this case. Uh, uh, Israel, of course, has been taken to the ICJ by South Africa uh, with regard to violation of the Genocide Convention. So I'm going to get into that in about a minute. But before I do, make sure that you hit the like button uh, here on YouTube. Of course, I want to welcome all the Rumble viewers. Thanks so much for joining on Rumble. I will share that link at the end of the video, uh, at the end of the stream. But make sure you follow me on Rumble. Uh, thank you to all the Rockfin folks. Uh, it looks like uh, I had to refresh the page. I don't know if I lost. I think I lost you um, when I disconnected. So uh, apologies to all the Rockfin folks for that. I don't even think I can get back in there. Um, yeah, so it looks like I lost Rockfin. Apologies to the Rockfin folks for that. Um, here we go. Uh, okay, so I'm back, but I think I might have lost Rockfin. Uh, and uh, be sure to go to the video description. And consider supporting me on Patreon, which is the best place, patreon.com slash Danny Haifong. That's how you help make this work sustainable. And you can also buy me a coffee, uh, give me a PayPal contribution, one-time contributions. Also, there are paid memberships yearly and monthly on YouTube, Substack, as well as Patreon. So all of that is in the video description, but we are going to talk about this ruling. Because I think it's very important to do so, <laughs> given that we have, I think, an unprecedented historical situation in its own right. Although, of course, uh, 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 it, we also have to take this with a grain of salt. I think there's a balanced analysis we could have, and I'm going to attempt to do that with you. Let me just pull up the sources I want to use today on this issue, okay? And then we will get to the analysis so thanks so much for tuning in uh this has been a great stream a little bit slower than other streams but i think that might be because of the uh big news that is being covered elsewhere and also it's a friday so friday streams tend to be a little quieter so i'm gonna get to this in about a minute as i just make sure i have all of the resources ready i think i am good to go here all right um so here we go history has been made israel after being taken to court in late december of last year taken to the international criminal or international court of justice i should say by south africa a verdict has been reached. So, again, history has been made. Israel's interim verdict, the verdict on Israel's violation of the Genocide Convention, which was filed by South Africa in late December 2023, has been reached. The International Court of Justice, its verdict is historic. It is a historic defeat in many ways, especially in the realm of public relations for Israel and the United States, NATO, Israel. None of them are going to be able to grasp their heads or grasp their hands and wrap their heads around what is about to come next. Well, we have to first talk about what happened. So. On January 26th, very early in the morning, Eastern Time, the International Court of Justice convened and gave its verdict, its interim verdict, on South Africa's case. And it was ruled that South Africa's case is favorable. It was ruled in favor of South Africa. This is immense. This is an immense victory for South Africa and really for the entire political and social movement 
that has arisen worldwide against Israel's onslaught in Gaza. And it's going to have huge geopolitical implications. So here is initially the first of many positive developments with regards to this case. Israel was attempting to have the International Court of Justice withdraw the case altogether. And here is the ruling on that motion by Israel from the ICJ. At the stage of making an order on the request for an indication of provisional measures, the court's task is to establish whether the acts and omissions capable, sorry, complained of by the applicant appear to be capable of falling within the provisions of the Genocide Convention. In the court's view, at least some of the acts and omissions alleged by South Africa to have been committed by Israel in Gaza appear to be capable of falling within the provisions of the Convention. In light of the following, the court concludes that prima facie, it has jurisdiction pursuant to Article 9 of the Convention to entertain the case. Given this conclusion, the court considers that it cannot accede to Israel's request that the case be removed from the general list. So there you have it. The case is not going to be removed. That is not going to happen. And essentially what the court did there is state that what South Africa has brought to the court is indeed legitimate. It's very legitimate. And there is enough to continue on the possible ruling, which will come at some point in the future. But here is the provisional uh, interim ruling. This is what the ICJ ended up enforcing or uh, coming out with a legally binding ruling on the merits of the provisional measures that South Africa was seeking in relation to Gaza, meaning that these are the measures that must be taken from here on forward as the court deliberates on the final verdict of whether the genocide conventions have indeed been violated. So here is what the court had to say. For these reasons, the court indicates the following provisional measures. One, by 15 votes to two, the state of Israel shall, in accordance with its obligations under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, in relation to the Palestinians in Gaza, take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention, in particular, A, killing members of the group, B, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, C, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, and D, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. For these reasons, the court indicates the following provisional measures. One, by 15 votes to two. So 15 votes to two, the court ruled, this is overwhelming, the court ruled that Israel has to follow these provisional measures that mainly revolve around uh, essentially stopping its genocidal onslaught in Gaza. Now, there has been a lot of debate about whether this means anything at all. And I'm of the position that it means quite a lot. So what the court has stated is that Israel indeed needs to and must stop any actions that could be part of this case, that is part of this case in many ways. All of the things that Israel is doing, the siege, the blockade, the bombings, all of that, those are included in these provisional measures. Of course, it's legalese. It's not specified. But Israel, given its particular situation, its stature, and how Israel has been treated by the so-called rules-based international order as essentially a U.S. pet project, one that has been protected more than maybe any other so-called country in this world, this is a huge historic blow to Israel, where Israel is now under the spotlight, has provisional measures against it that are supposed to be enforced within the next month. Israel is supposed to show that it is following by these orders. And 
regardless of whether Israel follows them or not, which I do not believe Israel will, and I'm going to show you evidence as to why later, I don't think Israel is going to stop anything. I don't think it's on its way toward ceasing its onslaught in Gaza. But regardless, Israel does now have this following it. And we do have through whatever international law is worth. And of course, there are major contradictions within international law itself. But for whatever it is worth, this is probably, this is the best thing that you could get from such a heroic act by South Africa. Now, there is even more pressure in the realm of public relations on Israel, and there is a legal basis to condemn and to stop Israel for what it is doing. And that leads to many particular possibilities, which are unclear whether they will happen or not. But I think what matters here is that Israel now is under a kind of political pressure, a kind of world pressure, international pressure that I don't believe in its history, in really the history of modern or even historic Western empire has ever faced. I don't think the collective West and many would say, well, Israel is not in the West. Let's be honest. Israel is a satellite. It is a protectorate of the collective West and always has been. And it identifies itself as Western, as a Western colonial outpost. All this is to say is that we've never seen this kind of uh, thing happen where a country of its so-called stature has been brought to this kind of court by a much uh, if you think about in terms of status, protection, history, South Africa, a BRICS country, a global South country doing this, it is it is unprecedented in scope. So here is what the foreign minister, Nerlende Pandor, had to say about, you know, the United States and Germany, uh, go figure are saying that this ruling is meritless, and so is Israel for that matter, and that's no surprise. Here is what Miss Pandor had to say, the uh, Her Excellency Pandor of South Africa, with regard to these comments. This is her response, and, and I think it's important because it spells out perhaps the sophisticated outlook that we can have on this matter. But what do you say to Germany and the United States who have called this case meritless? Well, the fact that uh, the court says, remember that today we're not deciding about the allegation of genocide. What we're dealing with are the provisional measures. It's clear that the court does say circumstances exist where it is plausible that genocidal acts have been committed. This, of course, means once the merit case is addressed, and if the finding is that there has been genocide, those states that have aided and abetted become a party to commission of an infringement in terms of the convention. Do you think there mm. So basically what Pandora is saying, South Africa's foreign minister is saying, is that uh, it, while a ceasefire would have been, of course, preferable in terms of the language, first of all, it was likely it was not likely that the court would rule for a ceasefire in a genocide convention as that is not what is being ruled upon this is the tricky thing and the problem with of course legal affairs that's not what was being ruled upon and that's not part of provisional measures but all of what the court has ordered could be seen as in its total package it, it tantamount to uh, in order for a ceasefire, because in order for Israel to follow these provisions, there has to be a ceasefire. And that's what Ms. Pandora is making very, very clear. But her broader point is really important in that if Israel continues on its onslaught, now that this ruling has been made, well, now there's legal basis to take countries like Germany, like the United States, like France, all of these countries in the collective West that have aided and abetted Israel, now they can be taken to court on the same account, leading to a potentially a cascade effect that will be a public relations nightmare for the entire collective West, which already it has been. What Israel is doing has been a huge blemish on the already tattered and beaten down political, economic, uh, global image, its stature and prestige 
with the global majority around this planet. So this is significant. And, and what uh, Pandor, what the foreign minister of South Africa, Nalendi Pandor, Pandor said, I think must be taken into account as a, a way of looking at this, a way of looking at this case in a manner that's more sophisticated than, well, we didn't get what we wanted. We didn't get the courts to come down to Israel, throw everyone, throw throw all of the Israeli officials and their aiders and abettors into prison. We didn't get a ceasefire. A lot of people wanted a ceasefire. That didn't happen. But it's important to recognize that while this is slow, while this is taking a, a long period, as unfortunately all matters of Western bureaucratic functions do, it is having an immense effect already on the geopolitical situation, especially with relation to Israel standing in the world, which is now completely and utterly destroyed. That is the historic defeat that I'm talking about, because that is a defeat. It does matter. Yes, there are people who have come to me and said, Danny, the Palestinians, tell them that there's a victory. Tell all the Palestinians are being bombed and killed. Uh, uh, tell the uh, uh, Israelis who are continuing this onslaught, they don't care about the decision, that this is some kind of historic defeat. Yes, tell each of them that this is a historic victory for the Palestinians and a historic defeat for Israel. And what I would say to this is that, well, Israel is losing their minds over this. And uh, the Palestinian people have already made the greatest sacrifice maybe that humanity has ever made in terms of uh, its own quest for freedom, their own quest for freedom and the the, the uh, objective of independence and self-determination, which was October 7th. That was the huge sacrifice that was made. So all of this is to say is that while uh, you know it's quite clear that Israel is not going to stop this onslaught, it's also clear that optics do matter, that every point where Israel or the United States or the collective West as a whole is uh, taken down a notch through a, a public relations win, as well as through a legal mechanism, which was once just resigned for either uh, the enemies and adversaries of the United States or some African neo-colonial dictatorship that the United States and the collective West propped up. That it was where these courts were once reserved. Now Israel is on trial. And not only was South Africa's case affirmed, but they just scored ma a major victory in the proceedings of this case. So it's important to recognize all of that and have this uh, kind of nuanced view. And here's what Ali Abu Nima said, friend of the show. I'll definitely have to have him back on set on soon in response he is the editor of electronic intifada a great publication ali abunima said what the south african foreign minister is saying nelendi pandor nelendi pandor is saying is correct israel cannot stop another genocidal killing and other genocidal acts against palestinians as the court ordered without a ceasefire therefore the order of the court is effectively an order for a ceasefire so there you have it. it that's, that is that is my position as well. This is effectively an order for a ceasefire. It is an order for Israel to stop what it is doing. And so if Israel stops what it is doing, which I don't believe that's going to happen, then we would essentially have the equivalent of a ceasefire. But here is what uh, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Yahoo, the uh, genocidal maniac, at the head of Israel's Knesset, the Prime Minister of Israel. I'm not going to read all of the joke Israeli accounts. Uh, I'll just go to the video and, and react to this. This is what he had to say in response. Basically, we will continue. This is an abomination. Here we go. Israel's commitment to international law is unwavering. Equally unwavering is our sacred commitment to continue to defend our country and defend our people. So Israel's commitment to international law is unwavering, and yet Israel has violated essentially almost, if not every single article of international law with regard to the rules of war, bombing hospitals, bombing schools, bombing 
refugee camps. Um, <laughs> this is just, I mean, this is just typical Netanyahu and typical Israel. Like every country, Israel has an inherent right to defend itself. The vile attempt to deny Israel this fundamental right is blatant discrimination against the Jewish state, and it was justly rejected. The charge of genocide leveled against Israel is not only false, it's outrageous, and decent people everywhere should reject it. On the eve of the International Holocaust Remembrance Day, I... There we go again. You have Mr. Netanyahu in Israel evoking the Holocaust as a justification for what it is doing in the name of self-defense. But uh, we all remember how Mr. Uh, Bernard Shaw, the lawyer, the British lawyer that was defending Israel, <laughs> he couldn't even keep his papers together in order to make the case uh, uh, in defense of Israel, essentially metaphorically and behaviorally showing that Israel has no case. Israel cannot defend its position because the writing is on the wall. 30,000 plus Palestinians have been killed, thousands of homes, buildings, hospitals, uh, civilian infrastructure as a whole in Gaza completely ruined more than a million almost 2 million people displaced the number it's the writing is on the wall this is a targeted campaign it is a genocide they said it as much the court has keeps and continuously states israel's uh, officials like yov galant the defense minister all of his statements uh, targeting palestinian civilians the president of israel talking about how no civilians are innocent. All of this is to say that Israel's case is absolutely uh, non-existent here. I again pledge as Israel's prime minister, never again. Israel will continue to defend itself against Hamas, a genocidal terror organization. On October 7th, Hamas perpetrated the most horrific atrocities against the Jewish people since the Holocaust, and it vows to repeat these atrocities again and again and again. Our war is against Hamas terrorists, not against Palestinian civilians. Again, Palestinian civilians have absolutely been the target because we can't even get good numbers. They say a third of Hamas fighters have been killed, which is a stunningly low number, even if true, uh, during the uh, duration, throughout the duration of this, conf of this conflict, or I should say the latest iteration of Israeli aggression. Only a third since October 8th or 9th or whenever they started their genocide operation. And yet 30,000 civilians have been killed. So their war is not with civilians, yet Palestinians have been murdered en masse, which led to this genocide uh, convention trial in the first place. Uh, this is just typical hand-wringing, pearl-clutching. Netanyahu and Israel are really under fire this is why this is important this is why this case is important because it just continuously not just exposes israel as if it needs more exposing but it also signals i think a sea change in how the world and especially the institutions that supposedly govern this world although we know that international institutions are generally governed by a particular minority section of the world in the West, but even these institutions are now compelled to come out against Israel, which will have long-standing effects that will lead to, I believe, Israel's, uh, uh, Israel's end, its, its defeat. We will continue to facilitate humanitarian assistance and to do our utmost to keep civilians out of harm's way, even as Hamas uses civilians as human shields. We will continue to do what is necessary to defend our country and defend our people. So that's a very typical Israeli response. I mean, that's basically been their line from the very beginning, uh, claiming that the only reason they're killing all of these people is because Hamas is using them as so-called human shields. When we've known now, and now we know, that Israel is actually using their own hostages as human shields, uh, essentially uh, killing them, bombing them. and uh, putting them in harm's way by continuing to keep them, uh, to keep, you know, thousands upon thousands of Palestinians uh, in prison without charges and continuing this onslaught because this would end very quickly if those prisoners were released, uh, if the Palestinian prisoners, 
if Israel made real commitments to stop desecrating uh, historic and religious uh, sites, uh, 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 if Israel would uh, begin the process of actually acknowledging Palestine's existence and its right to a Palestinian state and a Palestinian nation, all of these things would basically end all of this. And of course, uh, the hostages, so-called hostages, the prisoners of war on is the Israeli side would be released tomorrow if one or some of these terms or all of them were met and none of them are outside of the realm of international law itself. The international law says the, pa the Palestinian state should be established. It's never been followed, but that's what it says. There are many resolutions, dozens of them, talking about the 67 borders, talking about uh, ensuring that Palestine does become a nation. That is China's position. That is Russia's position. This is not out of the realm of possibility, but yet it has been rendered impossible because of Israel and, of course, because of the United States. The geopolitical implications of this are going to be massive. We already know what's happening around this case. So as this case has been deliberated, as this case has come out, we know that the regional situation, the global situation around this conflict is only intensifying. We know that at the Lebanon, so-called Israeli border, uh, Hezbollah and Israel are uh, uh, intensifying their struggle as Hezbollah comes to the aid of Gaza and attempts to divert military resources away from that operation. We also know about Yemen's heroic stand in the Red Sea and how Ansar Allah is causing what is going to be a months-long crisis, if not more, there, which will eventually, if we thought Europe was devastated now because of sanctions on Ukraine that, or sanctions on Russia via the Ukraine conflict, then we haven't seen anything yet, given that much of Europe's energy goes through the Baba Mendeb Strait and that much of the container traffic that is so necessary for global commerce also goes through the Red Sea. So uh, Yemen is not going to stop. All of the major Western mainstream media outlets are talking about it like this. And that means there's going to be e a cataclysmic economic uh, a, a crisis coming unless this is resolved. And uh, that was the hope, the hope for many of these economists, many of these investors, many of these uh, 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 folks in the West who are either following or directly involved in commerce have all said, well, this isn't a problem yet, but it will become one very soon. So that's continuing. We hear reports of a potential U.S. ship being downed by the Houthis, by Ansarallah in the Red Sea. And these attacks are going to keep on coming. And then you have the Islamic resistance in Iraq, in Syria, basically forcing the hand of CENTCOM, the Central Command, U.S. Central Command, into discussing withdrawals from both countries. You have Iraq's prime minister calling for the withdrawal of U.S. troops in Iraq. You have Biden, the Biden administration, contemplating a potential withdrawal of U.S. troops from Syria. Now, I don't know when or even if these developments will occur, but the reason why they are even occurring in the first place, why they're even being considered at such a delicate moment for the Biden administration, given that we are just uh, less than a year away from the 2024 elections, is because of the pressure that has been placed on the Biden administration by the regional forces, the axis of resistance in support of Palestine, and also the people of the collective West and the United States who have stood up against the genocide. All of these forces coming together to place pressure on the United States has led to them reconsidering how they are going to deal with the affa their affairs, their illegal uh, affairs in the Middle East. So this conflict has already had huge ramifications geopolitically. And the fact that a BRICS country is now coming into the forefront as a leader in this very important realm of information and public relations, spreading on the world's, the world's court, the International Court of Justice, the message of solidarity with Palestine, and having that court rule in favor of what South Africa is doing is indeed significant. There are moments in history that we don't always recognize are significant until the outcome 
much later. Israel is disintegrating as a legitimate political entity. It has already demonstrated what it is, what it hopes to do, what its interests are. These were not a secret before October 7th, 8th, 9th. Uh, it was not a secret that Israel <laughs> had plans to essentially ethnically cleanse and eliminate the entire Palestinian population. They mowed the lawn, they displaced, they continued the settlements, all of these things, the siege on Gaza, the blockade, that isn't necessarily new, although it's much tighter now. All of that was a slow rolling ethnic cleansing project, a slow rolling erratic project, a genocide. Now that Israel has accelerated the process in its onslaught on Gaza, now it finds itself in a very delicate position, one that could not have been predicted before this. Israel has been the golden child of the collective West, first the British and then the United States. This golden child, this military outpost in West Asia was supposed to be infallible and untouchable. Its expansionism was supposed to be controllable, meaning that there were not going to be conflicts between U.S. interests, Western interests, and Israel. Well, now we're seeing all of these fissures, all of these cracks, all of these contradictions emerge, which point to the fact that Israel is not a golden child. It is an illegitimate, spoiled child that is now out of control. I liken it to a dog that has been either not trained at all or ill-trained, and now that dog is on its own, meaning it is doing what it wants to do. It is going after every single living being as a potential threat to its existence. It cannot see otherwise. But the difference between a dog and Israel is that most of the time when dogs are aggressive in this way, they are actually afraid. They are actually in their instinctual uh, capacities and in their mind afraid of things that aren't they shouldn't be afraid of. Israel, on the other hand, is not afraid of anything. Israel is much worse than a dog that has been ill-trained. Israel is actually doing this on its own volition, on its own accord, pursuing its own interests. And that is, I believe, what is being completely exposed and there is no more empathy or sympathy and there's no more holocaust revisionism or anything that can pull israel out of the hole it has dug itself and that includes worldwide this is a worldwide phenomenon this is going to have ramifications for israel and also for the united states and for germany a joke of a country and the rest of the collective west they are going to have to answer the call. They are Biden is already having to answer this call every time he goes out there from his constituents. But why they so dutifully support this massacre. And that is also going to continue to damage the U.S.'s global standing, the West's global standing, and strengthen that of the multipolar world. BRICS is leading this charge. BRICS is leading the charge of support for uh, international justice for international law. It's no clearer than here in the Gaza situation. And you also have countries that are not really considered in the multipolar world, but are like Yemen, which are showing that they are aligned with Russia and China. They are aligned with the Palestinian people. They're letting Russia and China use the Red Sea for their commerce because they have decided, uh, Russia and China have, that they're not going to use the Red Sea to aid Israel. They they weren't aiding and abetting the, the genocide already, but they're not also going to go against what Ansar Allah is doing. It's a really beautiful thing to see, and it shows that the world is indeed changing dramatically. It is changing dramatically. Ask me 10 years ago if I thought Israel was going to be uh walk, you know, is going to be led into the International Court of Justice. And given such a verdict, and I would have said, absolutely not. Israel bombs Syria all the time. Israel is wreaking havoc in the region. And Israel was absolutely unhinged 10 years ago with regard to its dealings with Palestine. I would have said, no, Israel is untouchable at this point because the United States protects it. Well, U.S. protection isn't what it used to be. The world has changed. And indeed, this is a historic ruling. And we will continue to follow this matter 
uh, as developments emerge, as this case continues to move toward a final verdict over genocide. And at this point, it it is quite clear that Israel is guilty and that its time is fast dwindling. Its time is fast coming up. All right, everybody, that was the story I wanted to share with you. All right. Um, so, yeah, I got to figure out this internet situation. It's about 2 o'clock Eastern time. I am going to head out soon. Let me just do a few announcements. So I'll be back on Monday with Scott Ritter back from Russia. We will talk about all these developments, uh, in particular uh, his trip to Russia. So save the date. That will be about, I think it's in the evening on Monday. So uh, somewhere at 8.30 or 9, I have to confirm the time with him. And um, p.m. Eastern, okay? So save the date, Monday. I'll be back on with Scott Ritter. And then um, I will then, you know, there might be some breaks uh, for February. February might be a little bit less of a busy month because I got some matters to attend to during this month. Uh, for streams, but I will keep you all posted uh, about when I'm coming on, who I'll be having on, and all that good stuff. So Monday, that's the big one, okay? Uh, before you all go, be sure I'm going to give some shout outs soon to the super chats. Um, but before I do, I just want to and and to everyone who's watching and all of that. Before I do, I want to just say, you know, do go to the video description before you leave here after you like the stream, and be sure to subscribe on Patreon, Substack. Buy, uh, you can buy me a coffee. You can contribute on PayPal and, you know, you can be a YouTube member. And I, I do appreciate all of those who have become YouTube members over the course of the last several months uh, and also your participation in these streams because you are quite active here. So I really do appreciate that. It is very much it is very much appreciated. Um, also, uh, thanks, everyone, on Rockfin and on Rumble, especially those on Rumble for tuning in today. Be sure to follow me there. Let me just pull up that link quickly. Okay. So I am just going to pull up this link. I'll share my screen to my Rumble channel. Then I'll pull up the link. So I am live now on Rumble. And here is the link. Be sure you follow me here. That's what my channel looks like. About a couple thousand followers. Let's try to increase that. Okay. So here is the link to the Rumble channel. That is where you can follow me on Rumble. Be sure to follow me there in case something goes awry here on YouTube. Other than that, I just want to say hello to all the moderators. Let's see who we had in the chat tonight. We had Ware Pilgrim here. Uh, who else did we have? We had, uh, I see, where Pilgrim. I think I saw Desert Mantis earlier. There he is. Yes. Um, we have anyone else? That might be it for the moderators. We have Sherry, a YouTube member. Thanks so much for tuning in today, Sherry. Um, I think that was it for, I don't know if I see any other members. All right. So other than that, uh, let's see. Yes, Super Chats. We only had a couple today. Uh, we had the Iranian Putin who's a member now for one month. So uh, thanks so much for being a member to the Iranian Putin. Putin, as many people like to correct me. Putin. Uh, so Cloud Bilodeau. Bilodeau? Bilodeau? Okay. Um, that's very Canadian. <laughs> Hi from Quebec City, Canada. Great team. Merci. Thank you so much. Uh, very French. Very French. French Canadian? Cloud, very French Canadian. I don't know. This is my ignorance culturally coming up. Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> there's cat emojis. Oh, yeah, there are cat emojis on Rumble. I need to sell it more. People are saying, well, you know, I'm not a salesman. I wish I were a better salesman because maybe <laughs> I would do better at all accounts. Um, I do my best. Okay. Um, all right, everybody. So I think that's all for me. Thanks so much for tuning in. This was a good one. I appreciate all of your support as usual. Um, <laughs> uh, 
to all those on Rumble and Rockfin, thanks for much for supporting independent media. Uh, be sure you hit that like button before you get out of here today. Uh, be sure you go into the video description and support. Um, oh, it looks like I had a Patreon question a little late from Fahim. Please ask Professor with the introduction of Buy American Act as import, impact exports on China. All right. So uh, sorry, Fahim. He's always asking a question. Uh, I was unable to get to it today. But that's one thing you can get from Patreon is if you submit questions in time, I will ask them for the guests. Um, all right, everybody. This is it. Take good care. I will see you all again soon, this coming Monday. Have a good rest of your weekend. And until then, goodbye.